Okay, we're going to take some more notes. So we are in section 6.4, and you'll recall that last time we were looking at roses. So I'll just do a quick recap of that, because today we're going to look at some more of what are called the classical curves. And there are four of them, and one of them is the rose. And so what we have talked about with a rose is they have an equation that looks something like this. That's an example of a rose. And we have learned from our previous note-taking that this number right here tells you the length of the leaves. So when you graph this rose and you get, you know, these things called leaves, the length of that would be six in this case. And then this number tells you the number of leaves, but you have to be careful. Remember, if this number is even, there are actually twice as many. So this does not have four leaves. This has eight leaves. If this number had been odd, then you have exactly that number. So this would have five leaves, but this would have eight leaves. So that is what we um, talked about last time. If you're confused by that, go back and watch that video again or look back at your notes because you um, took quite extensive notes over that. Now, today we're gonna to talk about, we are on section six, still 6.4, but now number six, and we're going to talk about the next classical curve in our list, which is the Lima sign. Now, right now, that doesn't mean anything to you because you don't know, you know what that is, but we're going to graph one, and you'll get an idea of what a Lima sign looks like. So, first of all, the equation looks different. We'll do A. This equation looks different. Now I want you to look at the equations in number six in your notes and at the equations in number five in your notes. What do you notice that's different? They've got sines and cosines, they've got numbers, but what do you notice that's different about the equations in number six? The equations in number six have additions or subtractions in them. That's what makes them a Lima sign. So you'll see the difference. If it has adds and subtracts in it, then it is going to be the equation of a Lima sign. Okay, so now we're gonna type this into our calculators. And if you have not changed anything from yesterday, then you should be good to go. Um, so let's review the way we have our calculator set up. First of all, we're graphing a polar equation. This doesn't have x's and y's, kids. This has r's and thetas. That's a polar equation. So we go to mode and make sure that we've selected polar. Then we make sure our window is set up appropriately. So I'll write this down one more time. This is the last time I'm going to write it down. So please make a note of this. Theta min, zero. Theta max, 360, theta step, 15, or five, I mean, excuse me, five. And then for the first couple of problems, we're gonna leave our x min at negative five, our x max at five, and our um, x, what's it called, scale at one. And we're gonna do the same for y. This is exactly how you had it set up yesterday. I'm not changing a thing. Now, in a bit, this is a negative 5. Make sure you've got your min at negative 5 and your max at 5. In, in a minute, we're going to be changing that, and we'll talk about why. But for right now, that's going to be absolutely fine. So now we're going to go to y equals, y equals, and we're going to type in that equation. 2 minus 3 cosine theta. And again, just like yesterday, theta is this button right here. 
underneath mode next to alpha. That is how you get variables in. So before when you were putting in X's, you used that button. Now we're putting in thetas. So we have typed in this equation on our calculator and we hit graph. Now the shape that you get is very different than the shape that you got yesterday. Yesterday we got a rose, and so, I mean, they had different numbers of leaves, but they, they, they look like this. They had that kind of a shape to them. Now you're getting a shape that looks like this. This is called a lima sign. And you might be able to keep that straight in your own mind because this sort of looks like a lima bean. So a lima sign has the shape of a lima bean. Now, I know the question says, is it a cardioid? And I'm not going to answer that just yet. Um, we're going to answer that at the end when we're all done. But I want you to have this shape down. So next to the problem, just draw that little shape. Draw what you see on your calculator. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just this kind of a, a shape. That is our Lima sign. Okay, now we're going to leave everything set exactly the same way on our calculator. And now we're going to type in the next equation, which is r equals 2 plus 3 sine theta. Okay, so we're just going to go back to y equals. We're going to hit clear and get rid of that old equation, or just type in on top of it. 2 plus 3 sine theta. And remember, theta is the variable button under mode next to alpha. That's how you get a theta. And press graph. And we get, did you get basically the same shape, but did you get it configured differently? So what I want you to understand, and I'm not asking you to memorize any of this, but what I want you to understand is that depending on whether this is a plus or a minus, and depending on whether it's a sine or a cosine, that's what determines which way the lima bean is dented. So the last one you recall was dented on this side. This one's dented like this. It just depends on the signs and whether it's a sine or a cosine or an add or a subtract. I don't want you to worry about that. I just want you to understand that anything of this form, whether it's a sine or a cosine, whether it's an add or subtract, is going to be a, a form of a lima sign. So that was B. All right, so now we're going to do C. So this is problem C. And we're going to have to make a change in our setup here. Okay. Now, before you erase the um, graph that you just did, which was 2 plus 3 cosine theta, I want you to look at how high up that picture went. It went all the way to the top of your screen, didn't it? It went all the way up to five. And it went all the way up to five because of these two numbers right here. This one has a four and a four. So if we graphed it, on this uh, window, in the window that we have set up, we wouldn't be able to see it because remember, your window was set from negative five to five. And you did this with X and Y. Your X's and Y's were the same. So this window is not big enough for this problem. So I want you to change this to negative 10 and 10. Make sure that you do that on your Y's also. So go to your window, 
Leave the thetas alone, they're fine. But x min now is negative 10, x max is positive 10, y min is negative 10, and y max is positive 10. So you're leaving everything the same, except your mins and maxes for x and y are changed from negative 10 to 10. That's going to give you a little bit bigger screen. So when we graph this equation, we'll be able to see the whole thing. So let's hit y equals. Clear the old equation out and type in 4 plus 4 cosine theta and hit graph. And this time, you see a shape that looks like this. Right now, look very carefully, and this is this is uh, what I was trying to explain a minute ago. If you look very carefully, you'll see two hash marks beyond where that ends, and that's because you set your x max at ten. So this curve is going out to eight because of the four and the four. So these two numbers can help you determine how big you need to set your window. Obviously, just like before, if you didn't know that or didn't pay attention to that and you tried to graph it and it went off the screen, you would just go back and adjust your window to make it bigger. This just might be a help if you can remember that the combination of those two tell you how big your curve's going to be. Now, there's a difference though between this, this shape and the two that we got already. Can you see? Remember, the other two curves had an interior loop like this in them. This one does not have that loop. This one does not have that loop because these two numbers are the same. If you look back at equation A and B, you'll see that you had a two and a three here. And again, the add and subtract, don't worry about that. That doesn't change the conversation we're having right now. The add and subtract repositions the graph. When that was a two and that was a three, we had a little loop inside of our limousine. When these two numbers are the same, whether they're added or subtracted, again, irrelevant, the numbers are the same. You have what is called a cardioid. And the word cardioid should make you think of a heart. That is a heart. So a, a cardioid is a special kind of lemasine. A cardioid is not its own separate family of curves. It is simply a special lemasine, a heart-shaped lemasine. And that's because these two numbers matched. So if I look at the problems that we've done in part six, is A a cardioid? No, because the two and the three aren't the same number. Look at problem 6b. Is that a cardioid? No, because the 2 and the 3 aren't the same number. But c is a cardioid because 4 and 4 are the same number. So now we're going to sketch d, which is 3 minus 3 sine. Is this a cardioid? Yes because these are both the same number. Now, I know one of them is a subtraction, but again, I've already told you, what do the subtractions do? The adds versus the subtracts just reposition the lima sign. Is it dented on the top? Is it dented on the left, the right? Where is it dented? That's what that negative does, whether it's a plus or a minus. That's the difference. 
whether it's a sine or a cosine, that contributes to it too. We want to know if we're a cardioid, and the answer is yeah, it's a cardioid, because these two numbers match. Now, let's go ahead and graph that one. So we'll go to y equals, we'll clear out the old equation and type in 3 minus 3 sine theta and hit graph. And this one's a little bit squished up, so it's harder to see. But I think you can see that you do not have an interior loop. It is a true cardioid. It is a heart shape. And if you count the hash marks on your grid, on your, on your scale or here, or your graph, on your calculator, on your axis, if you count the hash marks... One, two, three, four, five, six. This is negative six down here. Would you expect that? Yep, because the, the size of your lemma sign is dependent on those two numbers. So a three and a three are going to make a six. Okay, what do you need to know? You need to be able to look at an equation like this and tell me if it's a cardioid or not. And this would be a yes, because these two numbers match. Okay, now we're moving on to part seven. And these equations look different. R squared equals nine sine two theta. This kind of equation, and I, I think I haven't said this, so I need to say it. That you can graph all kinds of things in polar um, equation form. There, you could make up tons of different kinds of polar equations and graph them. And that's something fun to do if you have some spare time. You can just make up whatever equation, type it in, and see what kind of shape you get. There are four curves, four types of curves that are studied extensively and are kind of the basic um, equations. They're called the classical curves. So we have the rows, which we talked about before. We have the limason, which we just talked about. So we know what roses look like. They're the ones that have like the flowers. They have the petals, the leaves. And then we have the limason. So that's a lima bean shape. Once in a while, a heart shape. But that is the limason. This equation is what we call a lemniscuit. Now, we're going to find out what the shape is in a minute, but I want you to look at the equation of a lemniscuit. What is different about that equation? What sets that equation apart from the other equations that we looked at in part 5 and 6? So in part five, we had the roses. Go back and look at those equations. And then in six, we have the limasons, the ones we just did. What sets this apart? If you said the squared, you're right. That's what makes this equation different. So the limason is going to have an add or subtract in it. The lemniscuit is going to have an r squared in it. You're going to be able to tell that's a lemniscuit because it has an R squared. Now there are many other curves that have R squareds, but we're not studying any of those. We're sticking to these. So if I give you an R squared equation, it's going to be some form of a lemniscuit. Well, shoot, what does a lemniscuit look like? Well, let's go ahead and sketch this. I'm gonna have you change your calculator back, um, your window, let's change our window back to how it was originally. So leave your thetas alone, but now we want x min, x max to be negative five and five. Don't change anything else except x min and max and y min and max. So go to window, go to window, change x min and max to negative five and five. Leave x scale at one, change y min and max to negative five and five. It wouldn't be a huge deal if we didn't change it, but this will give us a better picture. 
okay? So we have gone to window. We have left everything alone except X min and max and Y min and max. We've left everything else the same as it was. Now, I'm ready to type my equation in. I'm ready to go to Y equals and type in my equation. But the problem is, when I do Y equals, when I press Y equals, it says R equals. It doesn't say R squared. I can't type in R squared. So I'm going to have to take the square root of this equation. And that's going to give me R equals. So I am actually going to type in... I'm actually going to type in 9 sine 2 theta and negative 9 sine 2 theta. <clears throat> because when I take the square root, I always have to keep in mind the plus or minus. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides so that I have r equals the square root of 9 sine 2 theta and negative the square root of 9 sine 2 theta. Now, when I type this in, no big deal, press Y equals, clear to get rid of the last equation you had in. Then type square root, 9 sine 2 theta. And theta again, you know where that is, under the mode button. And then go down and type square root. Oops, excuse me, excuse me. Go down and type negative square root. So you've got to type, when you're putting this one in, you have to type the negative sign first. So your negative sign down here. And then square root, 9 sine 2 theta. And then press graph. Now, it's got a little hole in it. But I'm going to show you what the actual shape is. I am not a graphing calculator expert, so I'm not exactly sure what's causing it. But this is the shape that you have. That's the shape that you have. So, hmm, that's interesting. What would you call that shape? Well, there's lots of different things you could call it. I'm going to call it a figure eight. And the reason I'm going to call it a figure eight is that if I pronounce this wrong, lemniscate figure eight. It can help me remember the shape of a lemniscate. Uh, this is actually pronounced lemniscate, but we can say lemniscate figure eight. That will help us remember that shape. Now, it's really hard to tell because this is a diagonal um, picture. But see these pieces of the figure eight? They are three units long. Do you have any idea why they're three units long? because the square root of nine is three. So if this had been a 16, they would be four units long. It's just like with a rose, the number out in front tells you how long the leaves are, but the difference is this one has to be square rooted because it was an R squared in the original. So it's square rooted, so the square root of nine is three. Those are three units long. Okay, well, let's do the next one. Oh, and it is a 16. So r squared equals 16 cosine 2 theta. The last one was a sine, so just keep that in mind. We'll see kind of what difference it makes if you're a sine or a cosine. This is still an r squared. It's still going to be a lemniscate. So to graph it, I'm going to take the square root. So I'm going to graph the square root of 16 cosine. 2 theta, and I'm going to graph the negative square root of 16 cosine 2 theta. 
because when I square root this equation, it's plus or minus. So I'll go back to y equals, clear out both of the old ones, and now I'll put in two new ones, square root 16 cosine 2 theta, and then go down to R2, go down to the second row now to put the second one in, negative 16, and please use the negative, not the minus, the negative uh, square root. 16 cosine 2 theta and hit graph. Now, did you get a figure 8? Of course you did. This is a lemniscuit, so you're going to get a figure 8. But what's different about it? Well, see how it's positioned differently? That's because it's a cosine, sines and cosines, just like with the, um, well, with all of them, with the rows and the lima sign. The, the configuration is based, partially based on the function, sine or cosine, that's involved. And notice, you can count hash marks on this one. Notice, how long are these leaves? Well, they're exactly what you would expect. They're four units long. And the reason they're four units long is because the square root of 16 is four. All right, well, we have one classical curve left. And this one is a little bit um, trickier to graph. So I'm really, really, really going to need you to press the buttons I tell you to press. Um, because we're going to have to make some changes here in order to sketch the next ones efficiently. We can certainly sketch them um, the way we have things set up, but we want to do it more efficiently. All right, so the fourth classical curve, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be erasing all of this. But the fourth classical curve, there's only four of them, and the fourth one is the spiral. And there are two kinds of spirals we're going to study. So I'll go ahead and list them here. There's the spiral of Archimedes, and there is the hyperbolic spiral. Now, as we graph, we got one of each here in our notes, part nine, or part eight, part eight. We got one of each. <coughs> but in terms of your notes about the classical curve, these are the two that we're going to look at. Now, I want to go back before I erase all this and review one more time. We know we have a lemma sign if our equation has a plus or a minus in it. If it's got an add or subtract, if it looks like 3 plus 2 cosine, that is a lemma sign. It has an addition. If it has an addition or subtraction, it's a lemma sign. If it has an r squared, so if it's r squared equals, well, it wouldn't be that, but if it's r squared equals something, then it is a lemniscate. Now, look at part eight. This is the, the spirals we're getting ready to do. What do you notice about those equations? What distinguishes them? They do not have a sine or a cosine. So if there is no sine or cosine, no SIN or COS, then you have a spiral. So you're responsible for being able to identify these four kinds of curves. If it's got an add or subtract, it's going to be a lemma sign. If it's got an R squared, it's going to be a lemniscate. If it's got no sine or cosine in it, it's going to be a spiral. So Mrs. Ford, how do I know if it's a rose? Well, a rose is the other one. Roses look like this. Notice they don't have an add or subtract. They don't have a squared. 
and they do have a sine or a cosine, so that's a rose. All right, so how do we graph this? All right, we're going to make some adjustments in our calculator, okay? So first thing I need you to do is go to mode, and I need to change it to radians. We'll talk about why we're doing this once we get into it a little bit, but just change it to radian mode. You all know how to do that. Go to mode and click down to radians and press enter. Okay, so we're in radian mode. Okay, then we're going to go to window. Window. And we're going to set theta min is going to be zero. Theta max now, and, and we're going to type this, just write it down for now. We're going to type it in and then just write it down next to the thing so you can remember. Theta max, let's set it at 12 pi. Theta step, I need you to set it at 0.1. As a point one, x min, x max, x scale, x scale is just going to stay one. X min, um, we're going to set at negative 40 and positive 40. And the same with y. So X and Y are both going to be set at negative 40 and 40. Right now, kids, I am not expecting you to know, have a clue what I'm doing. Just do this. Set your window. You are in radian mode. Theta min is 0. Theta max is 12 pi. Your step is 0.1 x min, x max, x scale, y min, y max, y scale are the same. So set your y's exactly the same as your x's. Now when you type in theta max as 12 pi using the pi button, as soon as you press enter it changes it into a decimal. And that's fine. Oh, shoot. I'm going to have to have you make another adjustment, but let's get all this put in first. Because I made a mistake. But let's get in what I told you to put in first. So get everything, everything put in. So theta min, theta max, theta step, x min, x max, x scale, and y min, y max, y scale, the same thing. But now I need you to go back and change your x min and x max. And we're going to go with negative 120 and positive 120. And we're going to do that for x and y. So sorry about that. So here are our y's, and when you type in 12 pi, it changes it to a decimal, not a problem, that's fine. Point 0.1 is your theta step. x min, x max, x scale, negative 120, positive 120, and 1. And those are the same for the y's. So as soon as you have all that in, then you're going to go to y equals... Clear out your other equations, clear them out, both of them, and just type 3 theta. You pressed Y equals, and then type in the equation, which is 3 theta, and press graph. Now remember what we said we were going to get, what shape we were supposed to get. Do you see a spiral? That is a spiral. 
And that spiral is actually an Archimedean spiral, a spiral of Archimedes. Because if you watched it when it graphed, it started at the pole and spun out this way. That's the way an Archimedean spiral acts. It starts at the pole and spins out and around. So in terms of a graph, that's all you have to do. I mean, there's nothing fancy about any of these graphs. That's the shape. It is important that you have it starting at the origin and spinning out. Now, one other quick comment. If you count the loops that it makes, you will notice that this spiral is making six loops. Now, I'm just telling you this FYI, don't worry about it, but those of you that are interested in this, it makes sense that the thing we just graphed, the curve, the spiral that we just graphed, makes six loops because we told it to go 12 pi. Now remember, a revolution is 360. In, radi in radians, a revolution is 2 pi, 2 times 180, 2 pi's. So every 2 pi is a revolution. So 12 pi's would be 6 revolutions. If you wanted your spiral to spin more, then you would have to give this a bigger number. And then it would spin more times around. Of course, then you would have to make these numbers bigger because the more times this spiral spins, the farther out it goes. This is kind of complicated. I'm not going to have you graph a spiral on your own unless I give you the setup. You're not going to have to figure out the setup on your own. I will give that to you. I do want to talk about one thing while we're here, though. We have not yet discussed the step. We've talked about the scale. The scale is simply the hash mark set up on your, on your graph. We've talked about that. But we haven't talked about theta step. So we just graphed this. You watched it go. It was a beautiful, beautiful spiral. I want you to go back to window. And just for fun, I want you to change theta step to 5. The number 5. So change theta step. Okay, I'm going to leave the point 1 here because that was the one that gave me the beautiful spiral. I'm going to change it to 5. So just change that to 5 and hit graph. Oh my goodness, what happened? You did not plot as many points and you did not get a nice, beautiful spiral. Here is the background of what's going on. You know when you plot points, you build a T-chart. And theta max, 12 pi, is 37.6. So our biggest theta is 37.6. Our smallest theta is zero. Theta step tells you how far apart your thetas are. So if you set it at five, you're plotting five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and then 37.6. So in other words, you aren't plotting very many points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points is all you're plotting. And so, <coughs> so since you are only plotting nine points, when they got connected, they got connected with really jagged lines. When we used a step of point one, we were plotting a ton of points. We were plotting zero, point one, point two, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, all the way to 37.6. So when you plot that many points, you get a nice, beautiful shape. 
Well, someone might say, well, that's okay, Mrs. Ford, but why don't we use a smaller step? Now remember, point one is the one that gave us that beautiful picture to start with. What if we used a step of 0.01? Because what that would involve is plotting even more points. 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. That would be a ton of points. So think about that picture, plotting all those many, many, many points. What a great shape that would give us. Well, let's try it and see what happens. Go back to window, go down to theta step, and put in 0 0.01 and press graph. Now, some of you are saying, well, Mrs. Ford, I don't even see anything. Well, by now you should be seeing something. But what is happening? It is going very, very slowly. So we're going to get a great picture, a great picture, but it takes us forever. So what theta step does for you is it determines how many points you are going to plot. For all of the other curves, I used a step of five, and that seemed to work just fine. For this one, because I'm in radians, I'm using a step of 0.1, and that's what I would recommend. Again, if I am going to ask you to graph a spiral, I'm going to set all this up for you. If you're graphing anything else, the window you use is exactly the same as the window that we set up before. 0 to 360 with a step of 5 because we were in degrees with all of those. Okay, well mine's still graphing. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next spiral while it finishes up. We'll get it all set up and ready to go. Okay, so now we're going to sketch r equals 3 over theta. So the structure of the equation, we still know it's a spiral because it has um, no sine or cosine in it. No trigonometric function is in it. So we, we've got a spiral here. But... It's not 3 times theta, now it's 3 divided by theta. So we're still going to be in radians, so we are. We have to change that. We're going to go ahead and leave the same theta min and max, so 0 and 12 pi. We'll leave those the same. And um, we're going to use the same step. That worked before, we'll use point one and see how that works. Now, for x min and max, we need a little number. Mine finally stopped graphing. So I'm figuring out here, trying not to make a mistake this time. So for my min and max, I am going to go ahead and try um, just bear with me for a second. I'm going to go ahead and just use negative 0.1 and positive 0.1. And that's for x and y both. 
So our setup here, X min max, make sure you change your step back to point 0.1. Change that back to point 0.1 or it'll take forever to graph again. Change it back to point 0.1. And then let's use X min and max as point 0.1. Okay, and let's go ahead and type in our equation, so clear out the old one. Type in the new one, which is 3 divided by theta, 3 divided by theta, and press graph. Now it's going to take it a minute. What's different about this spiral? Remember, the last one we did started in here and started spinning out. What is this one doing? This one's starting out and spinning in. Now, it stops. It stops because we stopped it by saying 12 pi. We'll change that in a minute. But I want you to see that this spiral, this is a hyperbolic spiral, and it is starting out and spinning in. Now, if you want to see it spin some more, let's go ahead and change this um, to a 20 pi. So go back to your window, leave everything the same except theta max, type 20 pi. It'll change it to a decimal, and that's fine, and hit graph. You'll see it comes spinning in from the outside. And it's spinning around and around and around. And see it's spinning more than the last one did. And it stops eventually. If you want it to keep going, change this number. But again, if I want you to graph one of these, I will set all this up for you so you don't have to, to you know, figure that out. You just need to know how to go in and change things. So what's the difference between a hyperbolic spiral and an Archimedean spiral? An Archimedean spiral starts at the pole and spins out. The hyperbolic spiral starts out and spins in, getting closer and closer and closer to the pole. All right, before we forget, we're done with this section now, I want you to go to mode, and I want you to change your calculator back into degrees. So right now, before we forget, because we know how easy it is to forget this, go to mode and change your calculator back into degrees. So highlight degrees and press enter. And now you're all set. Now you're back in degrees. And we're done graphing. We have our classical curves all done. And you know about what's what. Okay, so now we're moving on. We're done with the graphing for a minute. Now we're moving on to number nine. Um, which says convert to a rectangular equation. Now this goes back, we got to just refresh for a minute. This is a polar equation. And we know it's a polar equation because our variables are r and theta. A rectangular equation has variables that are x and y. Alrighty, now listen, this is really easy, but there are a couple of things that you have to remember. When you are going to change this equation, take good notes here. When we're going to change this equation, we have to remember that cosine theta equals x over r. That's one of the definitions you learned way, way, way back before Christmas, that cosine is x over r. So the first thing I want you to do is plug x over r in for the cosine. If this had been a sine, then I would be plugging in y over r. 
because that's what sine is. But it was a cosine, so I'm going to put in x over r. Now I want you to clear the fraction. Whether it's a cosine or a sine, you're going to have a fraction. Get rid of the fraction. So to get rid of the fraction, I'm going to multiply both sides by r. So if I multiply both sides by r, I'll have r squared equals 3x, because I got rid of that r. And then the other thing I want you to remember is that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And before you get at all confused about that, you've been using that in the last two units. Because every time you made your butterfly bow tie, this was x, this was y, and this was r. This is the r. We called it the magnitude, but it's r. And what do we know about that triangle, the Pythagorean theorem? x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So you know that. You've been using it just without those letters. So then you come over here, and r squared is really just x squared plus y squared. And there is the answer to the question. It is that easy, guys. We're just changing r squared into x squared plus y squared. And that is the answer to the question. That is the rectangular form of the equation. Okay, so the next one, this is B. It says R equals 2 sine theta. So I want you to do exactly the same thing. So R equals 2 Y over R. So the first thing you do is substitute in the definition of whatever function you've got. In this case, we've got sine. So the definition of sine is Y over R. Now clear the fraction. Every time you do one of these, there's going to be a fraction. Clear it. So I'll multiply both sides by r. So r squared equals 2y. And then substitute in what does r squared equal? x squared plus y squared. And there's your answer. Remember, your job was to write a rectangular equation. That's what the directions to number 9 say. Write a rectangular equation. And guess what? This is a rectangular equation because what are his variables? The only variables in that equation are x's and y's, and that's what it means to be rectangular. We couldn't stop here, for example, because now we have r's and y's. Well, we can't have r's and y's. If we're going to be rectangular, we can only have x's and y's. So that's why we had went all this way down here. Okay, one more. Problem C, same thing, only it's r equals 4 secant theta. Oh my gosh, dig back in those memory banks, guys. What is the secant? The secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So secant is r over x. Oh, you thought you could forget all that? Oh, no, 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 not if you're a trigonometry student. we got to remember all that. Secant is the reciprocal <coughs> of the cosine. So we're going to substitute that in. So the first step, I don't care what the function is, the first step is put in its definition. A long time ago, you had a gold sheet with all those definitions on it. I don't know if you still have that gold sheet or not, but you can certainly look them up in your book, the definitions, if you've forgotten them. Now, we always get a fraction. Every, de every definition, doesn't matter what the function is, it's going to be a fraction. So the next step is you're going to get rid of the fraction. So xr equals 4r. 
Now this one's a little different. I don't have an R squared, but I do have an R on both sides. So I'm gonna go ahead and divide by R. And the answer is X equals four. The answer is X equals four. That is a rectangular equation because its only variables are either X's, Y's, or both. Okay, great. That's it for today. Have a great day. Thanks.